Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I'm starting the first of two videos where I directly address some of the misunderstandings of the science denial community on the use of the sextant and celestial navigation. Now, in the background here, we have a bubble sextant. This is a Link A12 aviation sextant from World War II. I use it to do three star fixes. The way that it works is that gravity affects a bubble in a chamber and creates a vertical within the sextant. And then the angle to the star is measured in relationship to that vertical. You don't need a horizon. That's why it was used in aircraft. Now, a marine sextant works in a similar fashion, except instead of having a bubble in it, it looks at the horizon and then corrections are made. There are still some corrections that need to be made with this one, such as index and semi-diameter, but you don't need to do a dip correction on it. Now that said, the first video has to do with a problem that the science denying community has comprehending scale. Now the purpose of this video is to demonstrate this problem that they have with scale and why light from the stars, the planets, arrives at Earth very nearly parallel. Because parallel light rays from these objects is the foundation of celestial navigation. So let's cue up the music and get going. Well, one of the major problems in the flat earth is a complete inability to comprehend distances and scale. Now, looking at the sun, you'll see it's about 93 and a half million miles away. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to figure out how big is the orbit of the sun. Well, that's the same thing as the circumference of a circle with a radius of 93 and a half million miles. And the formula for the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. Now that would give you a circumference with 360 degrees in it. If you look at one degree, all you would have to do is take that value and divide it by 360. So even though the, the Earth's orbit is slightly elliptical, we're just going to look at it as a circular orbit right now. So if you take 93 and a half million miles, multiply that by pi times two, you get the circumference of the orbit of the Earth. If you divide that by 360, you find out how much the Earth moves in one degree of that orbit, which is about the distance it moves once a day. So let's go ahead and do that math real quick. Now that comes up to 1.6 million miles. That's one degree of the Earth's orbit. Now, as you know, the light of the sun goes out in 360 degrees. Now, what is the diameter of the Earth? Approximately 8,000 miles. So if you were to look at the sun as a point source of light, the entire diameter of 8,000 miles accounts for about 1 200th of one degree of that sunlight. So the difference between here and here is one two hundredth of a degree. Now let's go over something that comes up quite a bit in the science denial community. One of the tenets of celestial navigation is that the rays of the sun arrive at Earth in parallel. Now, the people in the science denying community like to point out the fact that the rays of the sun are not truly parallel. So let's go ahead and examine that real quick. Now, the sun puts out light in 360 degrees. So if you look, at the light coming into this side of the Earth and compare it to the light coming into that side of the Earth, if the sun was a point source of light, it would be out of parallel by one two hundredth of a degree. The sun is not a point source of light. The size of the sun is about half a degree. So you can get light from the top part of the sun, you can get light from the bottom part of the sun, and you can get light from the middle. And if you compare this side to that side, it could be as much as half a degree divergent. 
Now the question is, how much inaccuracy would that induce in celestial navigation using the sun? One degree is 60 miles. Half a degree is 30 miles. So you may be as much as 30 miles off if you don't take anything into account. However, we do take something into account. We measure our sextant readings from the lower limb of the sun. And then we make a correction based on that lower limb to put it in the center. That's called adding the semi-diameter to it. So we actually cut that down quite a bit. And it's not unreasonable at all, and I've done it myself, I can get sub two mile readings on a sextant. What about true point sources of light? Stars. Here's the football stadium at Michigan State University. If the sun was on one goal line and the earth was on the other goal line, in other words, one astronomical unit is represented by 100 yards, how close is the nearest star? The nearest star would be 15,000 miles away. Now, that would be coming from Michigan and going to Perth, Australia, making a right turn and going up to Calcutta, India. That would be Alpha Centauri. It's one 1.5 parsecs away. Polaris is 132 parsecs. So on that scale, with 100 yards being one astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the distance from the Earth to Polaris would be eight times the distance from the Earth to the Moon, or about two million miles. Now, if the divergence of the rays of the sun from something that was on this scale only 100 yards away, can you imagine what it would be from Polaris? 132 parsecs away? Not the end of the football field. Eight times the distance from the Earth to the moon. It's essentially parallel. So you can argue all you want that the rays of the sun are not parallel. You can't really make that argument for the stars. But the sun, you probably could. Because they could be as much as half a degree off. That's going to induce an error in our navigation measurements of less than 30 miles. Probably considerably less because there are other corrections that are brought in to narrow that down even further. We can get it within about five miles with no problem at all, and that's good enough. Now, before we start talking about circles of equal altitude on Earth, let's go ahead and just kind of get a concept out of the way. Let's look up this red drawing right here. Say you have a flagpole that's 30 feet high. If you have a position here that is 30 feet from the base of that flagpole, and you were to measure this angle alpha, what would that be? I think it's quite obvious that angle alpha, by definition, would have to be 45 degrees, because that's what trigonometry dictates it must be. With a 45 degree angle, this leg of the triangle equals that leg of the triangle. And this is a rather popular middle school math problem. But here's a question for you. What if instead of being at this red X, we are instead here, a little bit closer to the flagpole? Would the angle formed from this spot to the top of the flagpole be larger or smaller than 45 degrees? So closer equals a larger angle. What if we're further away? Again, the angle to the top of the flagpole would be smaller than 45 degrees. Now, while this seems to be rather obvious, it's very important when it comes to doing celestial navigation. And the reason that it's important is that there is something in celestial navigation called circles of equal altitude. And we use circles of equal altitude to find our position on Earth. Let's go ahead and have a look at a circle of equal altitude. Now, let's have a look at the star Polaris, or the North Star. Now let's, just for the sake of this discussion, say that it is directly over the North Pole at 90 degrees. Now it's actually about 45 minutes or three quarters of a degree off of 90 degrees, but roll with me on this one. Now let's have a look at something here. First of all, this is a right angle formed by a line between the center of the Earth and the star, as it comes across the surface here, it forms a right angle to a tangent line at that surface. And this is called the geographical position of Polaris. The geographical position is the point on Earth that if you were on that point, the celestial body in question would be at your zenith, directly over your head at 90 degrees. That's the definition of what a geographic position is. 
Now, say we're right here at 60 degrees north latitude. Now, if we were to draw a line out through that point from the center of the Earth, this angle would be 60 degrees. Now, if you were to draw a line tangent to the Earth at that point, and you would draw a second line parallel to this tangent line, you would get a situation like this. Now, recall when we have two parallel lines with a line between them, we can come up with what they call corresponding angles. Those two are corresponding angles. They're exactly the same. Now, for the same reason, if we had two parallel lines and we had a third line that was drawn perpendicular to it, and then we drew two more parallel lines like that, these two angles would be corresponding angle. Now, let's go ahead and have a look at the light from this star and where it would come in here at 60 degrees north. Recall that Polaris is 132 parsecs away. The light from Polaris arrives at Earth in parallel. So, if the light from Polaris is arriving here at a right angle, where is the light from Polaris arriving here? It would come in from that direction and these two lines would be parallel. Now let's just lay a little geometry on you. That's a right angle. That's a right angle. Those are corresponding angles. Now, where is this angle right here? What is the corresponding angle to that? So, these two lines are parallel. That line is coming off and is parallel to that line. So this is the corresponding angle to that. This angle, 60 degrees, is 90 degrees minus that angle. Now that angle equals 90 degrees minus 60. So this is 30 degrees right here. What is this angle right here? Well, this angle is 90 degrees minus 30, or 60 degrees. Interesting, isn't it? Now, looking north, the altitude of Polaris equals your latitude. The distance from the North Pole to your latitude is 30 degrees, the same as the zenith angle. So simply by taking your sextant and comparing the altitude of Polaris to the horizon at dusk or dawn, you can literally read off your latitude after you make the appropriate corrections. You have to correct for index error. You have to correct for dip. You have to correct for refraction. And there's no correction for semi-diameter because Polaris is a point source of light. That's how you tell your latitude from an observation of Polaris. Well, I hope you found that enjoyable and thought-provoking, especially the sense of scale using one astronomical unit as 100 yards from a football stadium. Now, in our next episode, we're going to talk about circles of equal altitude and a problem in the science-denying community about trying to make triangles out of right angles. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe on your way out. I really appreciate your support of the channel. So until we talk again, be well.